John Piper said that worship is the ultimate goal of the church. When the age, this age is over and the number which no man can number stands before on their faces before the throne of God, all this preaching, all this teaching, all this ministry, all this mission will be no more. These are all temporary necessities, but worship will last forever. The word of God says in Isaiah 66, 22 and 23, for as the new heavens and the new earth will I make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed remain. It shall become to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another Sabbath, shall all flesh come together and worship me, saith the Lord. If you don't like to worship God here, if you don't like praise and worship here, if praise and worship is too loud and too long here, I don't know where you're going when you leave here. Because if you live and die in hell, they're going to be gnashing of teeth noise. But when we get to heaven, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that's going to be. We're going to sing and what, everybody? Shout the victory. And let me throw this in free of charge. I'm watching my clock, but let me throw this in. I say it all the time. We need balance in worship. Everybody say balance. We need something for everyone, young and old, new member and seasoned member. Black and white, visitor and member, educated and uneducated. We need law and grace, religion and relationship, cognition and emotion, information and inspiration, integrity and intensity, amen and hallelujah, holy scriptures and holy ghosts. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. I believe that we ought not just come to church to come to church. We need to drive 30 minutes just to come to church and look at each other. I think we ought to come to church and come to church ought to mean something. Something ought to happen when we show up in the house of God. If nothing happens, why should we come in the first place? There ought to be something that happens when we come into the house of God. Something that this experience does to each and every one of us that causes us to validate why we even come, even when we don't feel like it. Now, the Bible says, make a joyful, make a what everybody? Noise unto the Lord, everybody. Now, the psalmist does not say, be silent. The psalmist does not say, be quiet, be cute, but the psalmist says, make a joyful noise. Now, to make sure that we don't misrepresent the text, because we can preach it, but we got to teach it too. To make sure we don't misrepresent the text, you have to understand these two words, joyful and noise. Everybody say joyful and say noise. Now, when we talk about being joyful, when we talk about joy, joy is something that is internal, that is based on a revelation. It is not external like happiness, but joy is internal based on a revelation. When I know who God is, when I know what God has done in my life, it doesn't make a difference what happens on the outside, but it's based on what and who I know on the inside. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. There's a distinct difference between happiness and joy. Today, I'm not talking about happiness. I'm talking about joy. I'm not talking about that thing that is literally motivated by an external reality. I'm not talking about that thing that creates an external response based on some external stimuli. Let me break this down because somebody's still not getting it. When somebody gives you flowers, you're happy. When someone tells you you sang well, you played well, you're happy. When someone tells you you preach well, you're happy. When you're single and somebody invites you out on a date, you're happy. When somebody gives you money, you show up happy. But there's a distinction between happiness and joy. Joy is not based on some external reality. 
But joy is based on an internal revelation because if nobody takes me out, I'll take my own self out. I'll iron my own shirts. The next word is noise. Everybody say noise. A joyful noise. It's impossible to have joy without it being expressed in an audible way. Noise is just simply information that I'm trying to communicate, but when I try to communicate it, it comes up on the other side of articulation. In other words, noise is nothing more than something of uh, what God has done for me. That when I try to tell you about it, it goes beyond nouns and verbs. It goes beyond adjectives and adverbs. I can't explain to you the goodness of God. So when I open up my mouth and I try to tell you what God has done for me, the only thing that comes out of my mouth is some noise. David said, make, uh, make a joyful noise. There ought to be some evidence that you're excited about the Lord. Don't just sit there. God's done too much. It's impossible for you to be a recipient of God's goodness and not exalt his name. The world is making noise and the church is quiet. But when something is good to you, you can't keep it to yourself. And God's been good to me. And I can't keep it to myself. Folk run around church talking about if I had 10,000 tongues, that wouldn't be enough to praise him. God says, why don't you start with the one you've got right now? You've got to serve the Lord with a smile. What good does it say to say amen, sing and shout, and you mad? Angry. Rocks in your jaws. Can't speak, can't smile, have an attitude. You see, understand, when I get through saying amen, when I get through shouting, there has to be some continuity between my worship and my work. Because if there's no continuity between my worship and my work, then I become a contradiction because it doesn't matter how high I jump when I shout, but how straight I walk when I come back down. I am amazed at people's outlook on worship as we still have all these great debates, all these worship wars, and people will define what's appropriate and inappropriate, and yet, with all of that definition, they can be so mean with their position. You can't get up in church talking about, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go and out. No, sit down. What you should be saying is, I was sad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. you got to serve the Lord with what? Gladness. So when you serve, serve in a spirit of worship, serve with a spirit of praise, serve the Lord with gladness. Let me illustrate this some more. I travel the world. Once a week at least, I'm somewhere, flying somewhere. I fly a lot of planes. I have frequent flyer miles. I rent a lot of cars, and I have points on that too. Come on, say amen. amen. I eat in a lot of restaurants. I stay in a lot of different hotels. And you can tell the difference between a five-star Elder Ford hotel and a, Elder Duncan, a one-star hotel. You know what the biggest difference is? Because they all have beds. They all have restrooms. They all have flat screen TVs, Maurice, but the difference is service. And if there's anything that the church has got to learn how to do, we've got to work on our customer service. Oh, y'all don't like that. Preach, Pastor Bird, I'm doing the best I can. Come on, say amen. People will know we are Christians by our love. Collectively, we got to learn how to treat people. There cannot be a contradiction between your worship and your work. You cannot give scripture in one breath and can't speak in another. You cannot sing in one voice and not say happy Sabbath in another. You cannot serve communion with one hand and then not shake hands with the other. 
You can't want somebody to listen to you sing, but then you don't want to listen to them when they sing. It's a contradiction. If you're having a bad day, and we all have them, then maybe you shouldn't usher today. Sit down. Don't be passing out bulletins and you're mad. Here, take this. Take this. Now go sit down. No, you go somewhere and sit down. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Serve the Lord with what? Clap. Come before his presence with what? People ought to know that you're excited about what you do. Serve the Lord with gladness. You're in a parking lot with an attitude. Going off on somebody, getting somebody told. I want to turn somebody to the Lord. I don't want to turn someone from the Lord. I don't want to be a castaway. I don't want to hinder the work of God. Let me tell you something. God does not need you to do God's work. 